Well, good morning once again. The week seems to kind of go by rather quickly, and uh, I hope it's going well for you. I hope that uh, even though you may be dealing with some of those stressors we talked about earlier in the day, that earlier in the week, that, that you're finding a real confidence in the Lord uh, and knowing that um, sometimes we have to dig deep because God wants a deep planting in our life and he has a has a great plan uh, this summer uh, actually during the shutdown uh, when, when we went for a month and a half uh, with really being pretty much restricted to our own home uh, my wife and I started doing a lot of projects we planted some trees we got some great great big trees you know these kinds in the 50 gallon uh, pots you know and and they're pretty mature trees the problem is you have to dig such a huge deep hole in order to may enable them to really grow and, and flourish. And it was exhausting and it was hot. But your reward is that when you dig deep like that and you plant something deeply, what it produces is very rewarding in a much quicker and shorter period of time. So I don't know, God's taking you through a time of deep digging in your life where you're having to really wrestle and go deep into your walk with Him and even having those times where you're just praying and, and, and seeking God, sometimes with tears, as Paul said in Romans 8, with groans and travails. Um, those are, are exhausting and they require a lot of energy and they kind of dominate your life for a bit. But the end result is that great and wonderful things come as a result. Every time I've had a, a season of just really intensive prayer, uh, I mean, the kind that where you just feel like the Holy Spirit is just praying through you, it's so intense, uh, I've always said, seen it lead to amazing and significant results. So don't look at those times as being an indication of what's wrong with you or even what's wrong with the world, but what God wants to do through you. And that's the thing that I think in part of holding on is the recognition that my labor isn't in vain. You know, Viktor Frankl, in writing about the Holocaust, had uh, a lot of really good insights. But one thing that really stuck out in my mind was he said that the men who survived uh, the prison camps under the, under the Nazis would get up and shave every morning. And you think, well, that's a crazy thing. But think about it for a moment, especially us men, we can understand that uh, we're even told that as we go through these times where we're working at home, that people have a better mental attitude if they get up and they shave and they get dressed and they sit down uh, in front of their computers and their cameras like I'm doing. And they have actually taken the time to prepare themselves as if they're going into the, into the day. Uh, what Frankel brought out, he says, those people who shaved every morning uh, were men who had hope. They believed and hoped that they could survive another day. And there was something to go forward. That it was kind of a statement of, of confidence that I'm not giving up. I'm not going to uh, surrender to the emotions of depression, despair, defeat, discouragement that we all have to battle with, but particularly when we're going through very, very difficult times in our life. There's just that idea that there's something healthy of getting up and going. That's why, uh, you know, Doctors always recommend that if you're depressed, go for a walk. Uh, fresh air will help you and, and, and give you more of a, a, a clear perspective on your life. But there's something about that, that when I go out and I exercise or I take a walk and I do things of that nature, I'm really investing in my future. I'm really saying that I have a future and that it's going to be beneficial to me, even though the moment may look to, to be really dark and discouraging at this time. Uh, as I oftentimes remind my staff, I said, you know, there just needs to be seasons of celebration in our life, times when we just stop what we're doing and we have fun and enjoy ourselves. And so I just really want to encourage you to, to do that because he goes on in the passage that we're looking at and he says, he who overcomes, I will make a pillar of the temple of my God and never again will he leave it. It's interesting because we, again, we don't deal with pillars a lot. And yet the ancient temples and many of the great buildings, the basilicas and stuff, were buildings that had massive uh, carved uh, pillars. Uh, oftentimes the most resplendent ones were made of things like marble, but also limestone and some out of basalt, which is really hard. But the idea is that the pillar is what holds it up. It's the symbol of strength. The bigger, the taller, the wider the pillars, the greater the symbols of strength. And that's why the temple in Jerusalem had two bronze pillars right in the front not because they were needed to hold that part of the roof up, but because they symbol, symbolized the power and the strength of our God. And he says, basically, I'll make you a symbol of my power and strength. And this was significant to the Philadelphians because, I don't know if you recall, they were beset by many, many earthquakes. 
and much of the city was was knocked down and had to be rebuilt over and over again, so much so that the people who were able to kind of left and lived in the countryside rather than staying in the shaking, unstable place in the city. Well, you know who was left to live in the city for the most part were the poor people and a lot of the Christians who were kind of ostracized from the main of society. So here are people who are living in a, a situation where both figuratively and literally their lives are being shaken on an ongoing basis. And he says, I'll make you an unmovable pillar and you will never have to flee again, as they often did when the shaking started, to get away from the rubble and the destruction. And so it's all figurative. It's all importantly illustrative of something that would connect really with them. But he's simply saying, even though your outward circumstances right now look incredibly unstable, I promise that I will bring you into a season of incredible stability that I'll make you a people who no longer have to go through life running away from stuff, but you can spend your life running towards the goal of the prize, high, prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And uh, that's, that's something that you and I need to be reminded of on a regular basis because we live really in an, an era where the media uh, is doing fear mongering. <laughs> they're they're uh, exaggerated reports of the dangers and threats of things like COVID have left many people just hiding in fear in their basements. I mean, they're they're just terrified to be out and interacting and, and enjoying time with other people. It's kind of funny when we're talking about a, and I wouldn't I wouldn't even give it the level of a pandemic. I think it's an epidemic. It's a flu epidemic of a kind. And the death rate is um, barely higher than the seasonal flu. And yet it's being presented as being the worst health risk since the 1918 uh, swine flu. Um, not even close, not even close. It's much more comparable to other epidemics we've had. And yet you find people are terrified and, and and doing things that for years, even more most recently, the CDC and of course the World Health Organization and other organizations around the world always said that the lockdowns and all these things were not effective and they could only be used for a short term time. And yet we find that we're, we're driven into this kind of uh, fearfulness where we're, we're so afraid that we're going to contact the virus and die. Well, for some of you, if you have underlying health issues, I mean, your, if your health is not very good, um, then that's probably something that you should do, and you probably should be living in some degree of quarantine. But for the vast majority of us, the 99.85% of us, um, who, um, if we get it, it will be like a seasonal flu, uh, we're allowing ourselves to have a lot of our life uh, taken away from us and uh, coming increasingly under the power of government authorities who, that's the thing with government, used to say it about taxes, you know, they, there's no such thing as a temporary tax. Uh, they may pass it as temporary and then they'll make it permanent. And the same thing is with many of these edicts and mandates. They say they're temporary, but look at here we are over nine months now and they're still holding their, their foot on the brake. Um, and uh, without, in my mind, and in a lot of people's minds, a justifiable rationale. Um, if you wonder why I think that, I just recommend a, a, little, a couple of little booklets by Al, Alex Berenson. One is called The Untold, Untold Truth of COVID-19 and Lockdowns. There's two parts to it. They're really relatively sharp, short, uh, but he simply goes through all of the research and all of the data and all of the statistics and how those were come up with. And he shows pretty convincingly that uh, this has really been a tremendous hysterical, started out as hysterical overreach and now has become basically a, uh, a, a huge intrusion into the rights of, of the, uh, the common man. Well, anyway, Enough of that. So check that out if you have some questions, and we'll continue talking about the Church of Philadelphia tomorrow.